for me and for my generation, it meant a lot because it was the moment when it was still possible to study uh, architecture and study social life together. I did that when I went to university. You know, the word urbanist was coined in 1853 by Serda, who was the first planner of modern Barcelona. And that was his idea, that you'd put the social science and, and architecture together. I mean, for Serda, for Haussmann, and also for the American landscape architect Olmsted, that idea that actually you could see socially, that the, 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 the visual is not just a representation of social life, but a making of it, was transformative. None of them were theorists of this, uh, but the, for all of them, the notion was that the physical environment um, was something that could transform social relations. They all had a different kind of attitude toward the city than Engels had, for instance, in, you know, in the book on Manchester, in which the physical and visual, is just, it's a representation of class relations. Uh, there's this famous remark by Olmsted, who's the maker of Central Park, which said, if we want to free, he was anti-slavery, he was one of the first people who was a real champion of black rights. He said, if we want to free black people in the city, let's make a park, a place where they can go. I think they're fragmented. The city is deeply fragmented, but I don't think that diversity is a reason for that. What's fragmented cities is a desire for homogeneity to think about the city as a kind of factory of experience, where there's a place for everything and they're separated, is what leads to a tight fit between form and function in urban space. So a hospital is a hospital. A school is a school. You don't put them next to each other. You don't put them in a shopping center. Uh, you certainly don't mix different uh, races or classes together. You know, to me, the great error that a lot of lefty urbanists like us <laughs> make is an error of, that really comes out of a mindset of, of Jane Jacobs and Rudolfsky, people like that, which is that uh, unplanned, spontaneous growth will produce a livable community. I don't believe that. And I don't believe it because I am a lefty. I mean, I think left to their own devices, what you will get is class and racially and ethnically segregated communities. You get the factory of experience. And you have to plan against that. And there are, we know the kinds of forms that mix people well, you know? like synchronous forms of public space where many things are happening at once rather than a single activity. William H. White was, he showed in the most unlikely, seemingly unlikely space, the, the, the uh, parvis of, of Mies van der Rohe's Seagram Tower, that there's all kinds of synchronicity going on. That's a planned space, but the fact that there's a long, narrow bench next to water, where tons of people can go and eat their lunch out of the mainstream of traffic, um, is, is planning. That's social planning. It's a kind of terrible passivity to just think, oh, we can't do anything. We know how to build things, but we can't. The people will generate this by themselves. In a way, that's really looking down on people, saying, like, you know, if you were more intelligent, more skilled, more gifted, uh, you don't need any of that. You know, we are that, but we're going to spoil this beautiful thing, which is this spontaneous, organic community.
I'm really against that, you know, and I, th I think it's a challenge for your, for your generation, which is how to recover uh, what are the visual forms and the physical forms that allow people to be sociable? I think we can only do that in our practices by learning a kind of flexibility in design which breaks the mold of the correlation between need and satisfaction. I'll give you an example of this. Um, help design, part of the park system along the west side of Manhattan. There's a strip of highway, then there are beyond it for about four miles. There were, was formerly the docks of New York and these, and piers and so on. And for two and a half of these four miles. They've fallen into deep disrepair and so on. I remember that when we started working on this, th we were told, well, it has to be intuitively obvious to people how to use this space. And I remember thinking, there's something very wrong about this. And what's wrong about it is that you could see what every bit of the space was for. But we were living in New York City. It's a very dynamic environment where people change the uses of spaces all the time. The idea that good architecture is intuitively obvious how to use it is wrong. When I got to writing The Craftsman, I thought, well, what does that tell us about craft? And I began thinking about, for instance, different ways to do something and the rhythm by which, as you explore different ways to do something, you become better at doing it. In music, for instance, you can play a scale evenly on the piano after maybe two months of work. But if you wanted to play a scale evenly but staccato rather than legato, you would have to have a different kind of technique. You'd have to break the habits that you know how to get it to work. And you'd have to think maybe in start becoming self-conscious about playing smoothly, and then you'd reintegrate it as an unconscious practice. That's complicated. And we do the same thing in environments. I mean, comfort is a form of withdrawal. Not that you want people to walk on a bed of nails, but when you're in a challenging situation, you're, you, you know, not comfortable. It's based on a very simple uh, psychological principle, which is a cognitive dissonance, which is when you are in a situation where things don't fit neatly together, you develop what's called focal attention. You're studying the environment in which these things aren't quite working right. You're more attentive. Um, which is what focal attention is about. And a lot of the planning that we do smooths all of that away. But if you put, for instance, a, a, an ophthalmolic clinic in a shopping center or an old people's place in the shopping center, you know, experiments done in New York, people are uncomfortable that they're to, you know, to buy uh, yet another iPad. And suddenly there's a presence of these people who are visually impaired or are very, very elderly. Some of them maybe have dementia, whatever. But you're aware of your environment then. So, I mean, just coming back to this, the idea about this is not to make something nice, but to make something that's true to life. That's, that's my idea about this. And a lot of what happens in city planning today is that we don't we don't make cities true to life you know we make them into factories a theatrical experience it's also for 
uh, James uh, Corner. It was an experiment in in planting, you know, landscape urbanism of sort. But the High Line is really meant it's for tourists. Very few New Yorkers use it. Too many people. It's too hot. Um, too much motion. It's meant to move people along. It's an experiment. It's got the same appeal as in the 90s. Every city needed to have an aquarium. It needed an attraction. Now every city needs a high line and a guardian bridge, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's fine. I wouldn't spend a lot of money on it. I loved the London Eye, just for that reason. Cheap, wonderfully gaudy, tasteless, fun, scary. But I wouldn't spend billions of pounds on it, mm. which the, uh, the Garden Bridge will cost. Why do it? Why not rebuild a housing estate? Build something people can dwell in.